Wow, we are back for Todd Talks is 2020. I am joined by James Hake and James Intracasso. It's an all James show today. Woo. It's and... James Talks now. <laughs> James Talks. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to make that joke. Um, so uh, there's been some news. Yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. We've got uh, the Explorer's Guide to Wildmount out. James Hake and James and Tricasso actually wrote for the book. Uh, and I also, I probably would have had them on anyways, just to talk about the monumental uh, kind of moment we're having right now for D&D and having uh, Critical Role and Matthew Mercer setting join uh, Dungeons and Dragons proper. Am I wrong in thinking this is very much like when, ev- when they made the competition originally and they allow people to submit their, you know, their campaigns and, and their ideas. And they chose Eberron. Like, that was, like, just monumental. Eberron was such a completely different setting. It was crazy that someone from the community actually, you know, introduced a new D&D setting from outside the company. I feel like this is very much that. And I would argue a, a whole lot more. <laughs> I think that the biggest more about it is that critical role, you know, is, is a thing already, right? When Eberron happened, yeah. everyone was new to D&D and people were excited by the new stuff it brought to the table. But here, critical role, we know what critical role is bringing to the table. We know what, uh, well, people who've watched the show or, uh, yeah. you know, followed the media know what it is about it. But for a lot of people, uh, it is all brand new. Yeah, it's a legitimizing, too, of, like, this property that everybody knew was, like, the Game of Thrones of actual play shows, right? Critical Role. Right, right, right. But now they're working hands-in-hand with D&D. Like, officially, in a big, bad way, they are bridging the divide. And I think that is also huge. But, yeah, this world, I think, is, uh, is extremely different and is going to give people a different offering for their games too like and we say games. game of thrones in terms of massive popularity not yeah, in no. terms of quality <laughs> of ending. Yeah. right 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 yeah uh, i'm gonna go with witcher two years from now oh <laughs> sure. sure yes yeah uh, well, the Wild series Mount on does have some kind of witcher vibes to it also oh yes uh, um, Wildman feels i mean i i i mean just my personal experience in talking about The Witcher with Matt, I've always felt there's some some like interconnective tissue there. I mean, mm-hmm. I he likes The Witcher. <laughs> the, the the fantasy isn't maybe quite so grim as The Witcher can be, but it de- definitely has that sort of uh, that that gritty tone to it. It's just also uh, melded with the sort of high magic, wild fantasy that D and D just naturally has on its own by virtue of having, you know, 20th level wizards somewhere in the world with yeah, time I, stop and meteor swarm and I stuff like that. Exandria by nature, um, especially given that players are involved. <laughs> 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 like, is, like it, as dark as you can always want to make your campaign setting right, um, doesn't mean that's how it's going to go. Uh, so your, your players are going to inter- interject humor, funny things are going to happen, people are going to talk about putting <laughs> the sun on their butt, uh, <laughs> as we learned recently, and uh, talk about pornographic books. <laughs> and there's going to be these com- comedic moments that are like fantastic that are going to like, you know, be nice, sharp relief from the super dark world, right? And that, that's why The Witcher kind of reminds me of, of Wild Mount in that way. Um, is that, uh, yeah, Alexandria has humor, <laughs> very much. <laughs> um, but it can also get desperately dark. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. if, if, if the dice go wrong, um, there, there is no, I would say a lot of D&D campaigns and D&D in general, uh, mm-hmm. it's far too easy to resurrect people <laughs> for me, <laughs> for my taste. Like, death is not scary. Like, <laughs> you know, like being injured is not scary to me. Like, someone's got cure mm-hmm. wounds. Um, yeah unless you have an insane party but i digress so what what do you feel that exandria wildmount brings to the table for dnd and for for dnd in general like amongst the kind of like the pantheon of different settings for dnd um how how does this change the game really so one huge thing um that they talk about a lot in the book is this idea of war which i don't think war in general is new to D settings you know eberron is dealing with like the fallout of a war and there's wars left and right but this idea of a war that does not have like a clear cut 
uh, good side and evil side that is currently ongoing when you step into the campaign, I think is a huge, huge thing because it's one of the first campaign settings that I've seen where it's like, you can kind of pick your side or it can just be about surviving in mm -hmm. this continent that is torn by war. And it is truly like there are good people on both sides and there are evil people on both sides. And uh, a lot of people are fall into like this morally gray area that so many people do during war. And I think it really captures that well because it's happening right now. Like the war is on. And that's a huge thing that I think contributes to that. You know, The Witcher, right? We're talking about The Witcher yeah, has yeah, a war yeah. in it. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's that. But there isn't so much complexity in that. And Dragonlance certainly is at war, but you start Dragonlance um, when I was playing the modules when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. um, and I played Raceland because Raceland is dope. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I will become a god. Uh, but that's, that's right at the beginning of the war. Mm -hmm. But it is very black and white. Like you it's are like Star fighting. Wars. Yeah. It yeah. is absolutely Star Wars. You're fighting Tachesis. Um, it, it, it's all red, all evil dragons are super evil. The dragon high lords are super evil. Like that's, but, but, but Alexandria is, um, in the way that the man has always run it. Not it's, Alexandria. Sorry. Just yeah, Alexandria. Alexandria. <laughs> Alexandria. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a um, new spinoff. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so that's the sense I get from Wildmount as well. Is that that's that's what we're going to be involved in is is this um, yeah that that complexity and even yeah, a bit more going adult. off of yeah going off of that idea too. I I think there uh, you may find some people playing D and D right now that really enjoy the black and white nature of good guy bad guy conflict and yeah. uh, Wildmount isn't without that too. Right, mm -hmm. Critical Role often leans into the hard moral choices because that's what the players of Critical Role really enjoy, but there are some situations where it's just plain and simple, these are the bad guys. Uh, there's an arc in Critical Role, without spoiling too much about the show if you haven't watched it, um, <laughs> there is this great leviathan called Ukotoa uh, involved in the lore of the Menagerie Coast tropical sea piratical region of Wildmount, and there are some, there are some bad people who would really <laughs> love for this leviathan to kind of unmake the world mm -hmm. in its own way. And so it, you don't have to worry too much about, you know, when moral conflict starts to wear you thin, you just like say to your DM, man, I just want to kick some bad guy ass. They're like, okay, we've got the spot for you too. <laughs> yeah. um, go for a Kraken. Yeah, <laughs> right. Well, and-, and uh, What could know, possibly go wrong? <laughs> without giving too much away, right? Ukatoa is- uh, the tip of an offering of really cool evil stuff, um, you know, and things that might be available to be, you know, various uh, warlock patrons, even if you want to play an evil party, because there is this uh, moral war that is morally gray, you also have that option. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is like a totally viable thing that you could sustain you in a campaign the way being evil doesn't necessarily sustain itself in other worlds yeah. well this is I, this is something i've always i've always played morally gray characters and so i i I, mm -hmm. I i'm always sad if a dm punishes you for that i have played many an assassin um who's doing like evil for the sake of good or or like light semi-charming evil um <laughs> <laughs> if such a thing is possible um and so I think this is one of the perfect settings to kind of survive in that. Um, I think it'd be very, pretty cool. I mean, I, I, I feel like Matt, Matt's setting is like the perfect place to play like a celestial warlock who is evil. You know, the thing I've always wanted to do, you know, like I'm killing people for for a unicorn or something. <laughs> or like I'm, I'm the one the gods go to to like get somebody whacked. Like I'm not a priest because I don't believe, but here's some magic. Mm -hmm. We need some people to not be talking anymore. <laughs> Yes. When it comes to things that are special about Wildmount uh, in this particular vein, uh, something that, and I'll, I'll compare to Forgotten Realms because I think it's an apt comparison. Forgotten Realms always has this feeling of the, uh, the divine looming over everything, right? Back in third edition, the time of troubles, the gods walked the earth. Yeah. That was a very Forgotten Realms moment. In the world of Exandria, which Wildmount is a part of, there is literally a supernatural gate 
around the inner planes that prevent the gods from directly affecting the world. They are locked out. And it's a whole big deal. Um, and so while there are immense uh, divine supernatural powers that uh, characters who reach the higher echelons of D&D levels can, you know, combat or ally themselves with, like Vox Machina did in Campaign 1 of Critical Role when they hit, you know, 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th level. A lot of the story of Wildmount is very grounded, very human, very personal. Uh, and you'll see that if you watch the show, a lot of the early conflicts, levels 2 through you know, even now to a certain degree are just like these normal people are trying to survive in the midst of occult activity, in the midst of war, in the midst of, you know, crime lords running their lives. How, how are you going to help them or how are you going to ignore their plight for your own benefit? Right. It's, yeah. um, and it's not unheard of to like, because it is, that, 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 that is a complication sometimes when you're, you're making a setting for D&D &D, um, is there are so many gods and you have to answer the question like what is their role and um this is an inter interesting question for like say eberron which kind of locks out most of the regular pantheon of gods mm. um from being involved in somewhat a similar way um and then the dragonlands pantheon is kind of nuts because all those gods are terrible people <laughs> uh <laughs> yeah. like kind of ir not redeemable really um when if you know anything about dragonlands um but yeah i like this i like the i very much like the separation of the gods yeah. from that world because it takes it puts so much more pressure i feel like on players sometimes mm -hmm. um like the choices this world all everything that's happening to this world it's kind of your fault at this point right like okay. the gods have left a long time ago <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> like this is on you well, and that's what's one of the things that is great and unique about Wild Mount, right? Is like in Eberron, there's kind of this question of like, are do the like we know there are clerics, but do the clerics really get their magic from gods? You can be like an atheist in yes. Eberron. Whereas in Wild Mount, the gods walked the earth at one point. They were on that planet, they fought this war with each other, and now they're gone. Right. And so mm -hmm. it's kind of like struggling too with that idea of like you said, the gods have left us. What does that make us? Right. What why are we so terrible that the gods would leave us? Um, you know, and mm -hmm. yeah. There's also then stuff lying around that like maybe a god touched, you know, <laughs> or lived there <laughs> yeah. or whatever yeah. it is. And that's also really cool. A lot of creatures bear the marks of the gods' own influence. Mm -hmm. Um I think the uh, the origin stories of goblinoid creatures and of orcs in Wildmount is very, or in all of Alexandria actually, is quite interesting. I won't I won't talk about it too much, but they are the direct result goblins of uh, a completely other people being transformed into soldiers for Bane, the god of tyranny, during the divergence during the War of the Gods, and. This brings up some interesting questions on the typical like ethics of D&D &D, in which, you know, D&D, &D, you fight monsters, you take their loot, you gain XP, and all that goes on. Um, and goblins and their kin are typically, you know, acceptable targets uh, in big quotation marks for that sort of adventure behavior. And the people in the Dwendalian Empire, the sort of humanocentric uh, totalitarian core of Wildmount, very truly believe that common wisdom. However, if you go outside of the Grindalian Empire, if you go into the Kreen dynasty, their rivals, you'll find that the nation is not made up of the typical D&D &D, uh, races. You'll find that it's got a, the core of drow who have abandoned the worship of Lalt and came to the surface of the world. You'll find that they have allied themselves with everything from bugbears to orcs to kobolds to, you know, any sort of also in big scare quotes, monster race in D&D that you can think of, and that these people, they're people, right? They're not monsters, they're people. And that conflict that I think a lot of people in real life are grappling with right now when it comes to D&D is being like actively fought over in a war in setting. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. It's also very telling, like this is, it, it feels, and this is, this is what I like about the setting uh, is that this is kind of where we are with fantasy right now. Like Game of Thrones um, was very post Lord of the Rings, right? Like mm -hmm. there is like every, no one's coming out of Game of Thrones clean. 
as they like out of, that, out of those books or even that the, the that tv show and that's a good example of like where we want our fantasy to be now we i feel like we want either something crazy and kooky or we want something very very grounded and realistic um and not necessarily something like you know like aragorn who was born to be king <laughs> right it won't stop telling everyone about it um yeah. read the books different character <laughs> yeah i think stories that say you can be a good person but it is a difficult thing and it takes a lot of work yes are yeah. are important right now and that is a big thing in wild mount right that you can be good right you can uh help a lot of people in a time of need but it is going to uh cost you something right it's going to cost you work uh and if you take the easy way out that's going to cost you a piece of your soul mm -hmm. right um right. and and Not we literally see that speaking with like Avernus, but <laughs> right yeah yeah uh figuratively right you know but we see that like even in the good place um you know mm. the good place is about like being a good person is hard um right and yeah. and so i think wild mount really taps into that in a way that is fun and you know as joey said earlier there are big evils that you can go off and ignore the war but the war is still going to be there and part of it and this uh you know uh this thing called the calamity uh which i know matt was talking with you on on your videos about todd you know that sort of sets the history of exandria is also a war so there's this presence of this like Hey, remember that time the world almost ended? Uh-oh, are we about to do that again? Mm. Uh, which also feels very prevalent this day and age in our modern world, you know? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there's actually a sidebar in the very beginning of the book that talks about war and how much you want to include it in your game because it, it's a hard topic to deal with, uh, both from a like, you know, I hate war, I don't want to talk about it. And also like, how do, how do I run? A, a war, this is this politics, it's like uh, continent spanning politics. Am I ready to run a game that involves that so heavily? Um, and, you know, we got to acknowledge that not everyone wants to do that. Uh, and so there is there are some gentle guidelines for anyone coming into Wild Mount Fresh that uh, sort of gives you three different intensities of dealing with the war. Uh, either I don't want any of it, to I want in the background, to I really want to get my hands dirty with it. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who is Todd? Is he, is he taking a vacation from us? <laughs> it is James Talks now. It Welcome is to James, James Talks, everyone. Talks now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Finally, finally, we have taken uh, over. Sir, sir, oh, my oh hey, the camera <laughs> fell. <laughs> Hey, Todd. The camera like <laughs> fell up against the wall. <laughs> oh, no. I'm like, I'm just going to say there, everyone's staring at my armpit as I try to fix that. <laughs> <laughs> I figured I had turned the camera off. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> so, well, uh, I got to ask what are some of the challenges? I would have been nervous to walk into someone else's uh, house. Mm hmm. Um, especially one that has become so popular. What was it like <laughs> writing uh, for this book? Mm -hmm. uh, so I was not a, I would not say I was a critter before we started this book. I, I liked Matt and I had seen a handful of critical role and I had liked, um, you know, what I had seen. Uh, but when Matt asked me to be a part of it, I said, yes. And I just binged uh, season two as hard as I could and then went back and started binging season one so that I could like jump right into it all, right? Um, and uh, And it was, I was very nervous about coming into it because it's this huge world and it's, so beloved by many people. And I knew that James had previously worked on the Tal Duray guide. Uh, so I was like, oh man, I'm coming in. And you know, Chris Lockie works on the show. And I was like, I am coming in with heavy hitters who really know what they're talking about. And it's going to be real hard. Um, and it was like a super open writing process where, you know, Matt obviously had his story laid out and knew what he wanted in this world. But he set the tone for like, I would like these parts of the world fleshed out. I have a general idea of what's here, but let's talk about what you think could be there. And if you don't like it, feel free to challenge me and suggest something else and we can talk about it. So it was like, there was zero Matt Mercer ego 
throughout the entire process and that yep. made everything better <laughs> I'm not sure he has one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Zero. It's, it's very yeah. disconcerting. <laughs> his his ego is limited to uh, only letting, you know, good people in with the world, right? Not giving up control to people he doesn't want to, right? Right, right. Yeah. That's uh, just uh, being healthy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not so much ego as it is setting boundaries, and that's very good. <laughs> Yes. Uh, yeah. so for now, you you did of course work on a previous book for Crow mm. Roll, but what was were there any unique challenges for this one? Yeah. So I I met Matt Mercer while I was an intern at Geek and Sundry years ago, and I worked on the Teldori campaign setting with him, and that was delightful. Um, so I came into this one very much knowing a lot about Critical Role, a lot about how Matt works as an author, and a lot about you know how we work together just as two individuals. And so bringing in more people and expanding that circle was uh, was a great way to start it off because now instead of just me and Matt having a conversation back and forth, we could get the opinions of, of James and Chris, like, is this is this actually good, right? Like it, it fits with what we've made, but like, does it really? <laughs> um, and it, it made it possible to really divide up what we were doing more easily, right? There, there were four adventures in this book, which boggles my mind still. Mm -hmm. um, one in each of the major geographic regions of Wildman. We were just able to say, well, okay, there's four of us, there's four of them. Let's just each take one. And we were able to, let me set up this contrast. In Taldore, when we were working on that book, I edited Matt's work while he edited my work. And we just like every single uh, word in that book, uh, practically, uh, we had both touched at some point. Whereas here, we were much more able to uh, sort of let people off to their own devices. And so I've, I've read everything that James has wrote, but I didn't get in there and, and monkey with it, which was freeing. And I, I, I think that even though the, the voice like the writing voice when you read the book will be very, very even and very, very clearly a, a group effort. There's a lot of different ideas that all went into here and th those distinct ideas are still very clear. Yeah. Now there, there is a question from the, from, uh, the audience right now for yeah. Twitch chat. And, and that, that, this is a good question. Um, for those, uh, like they're wondering if this is covering areas not yet covered by the show. Yes. Oh, and yeah. clearly, yes. Like, yes. <laughs> there, there are regions in this book that you have barely even heard of in the show. Yeah. Um, can we say their names? I'll say their names. There's yeah. one you worked on, James. Yeah, I, I uh, so this has been, they like talk about it on the show and every time they talk about it, I'm like, oh, uh, because I listen all the time now, right? I got hooked yeah. uh, and I now am a, a full on big time critter, um, which is whenever they mention Isilcross, um, which is this collection of sort of frozen lands uh to the north of uh wild mount um that is a region that i got to detail a lot working with the rest of the crew and what's fun about the the process is that we would read each other's stuff and you would get uh, rather than somebody saying like, oh, wow, here's everything that I would do differently, you would get these suggestions that were like, hey, did you think about this? What do we, how do we feel about adding this here? And uh, that makes everything so much better. So yeah, that's just one of the places in the book uh, that is more detailed than it has been on the show so far. Yeah, another region that has only been mentioned in utmost passing in the book is the... Uh, uh, realm of Blightshore mm. on the far eastern end of the continent, farther even than the wastes of Jorhas, where all this strange, lingering, almost like fallout from the from the calamity, the great catastrophe in well in uh, Exandria's history. There's just a lot of forgotten stuff over there, and people do their best to stay out of it. But that makes it a great place to go adventuring, just like <laughs> Isilcross. Yeah, and, and the point is, like th this book has. Uh, you have plenty of room to just play like mm. you, you don't first off you don't need to feel beholden to the tv show or mm -hmm. feel like that you've got something wrong because there's it's a big continent you can mm -hmm. you know <laughs> europe's a big place <laughs> um, 
<laughs> you could set your game in Europe and not interfere at all with a lot of the things that happened in Europe. <laughs> so, so here's a big challenge that some people might might think of when they approach this setting or a setting like Middle Earth or the Star Wars Galaxy when they play a licensed role playing game in those settings is that the weight of canon is very heavy. Right. Uh, if you go into this and you see that there are more than 100 episodes in Critical Role Campaign 1 and approaching 100 episodes of Campaign 2, you might think to yourself, oh my God, how can I possibly, you know, inform myself of everything going on in here? And how can, you know, my, my players hope to know all of that too and inform your decisions based on it? And uh, the, the four of us were very, very cognizant of that going into this that right at the beginning of the book, we make it very clear that this book is set in a pr very specific point of time and that uh, your canon will diverge wildly from that of Critical Role. Uh, it's, it's episode 50 of campaign two, of season two, and uh, things will happen completely differently from there. The, the, the Mighty Nine, the heroes of Critical Role, you are fully within their rights as a DM to say, uh, yeah, so about a week after the campaign begins, the Mighty Nine are killed horribly in the wastes <laughs> of Jorhas, and every single thing that has happened since episode 50 does not come to pass. Mm -hmm. And like, <laughs> that's awesome. Suddenly you are in a radically different butterfly affected world than the one that the actual canon of Critical Role is happening in. And that's yeah. super important for players. Yeah. Like yeah. you yeah. need to have that freedom. And I feel like if you do... Um, and I have experience with this very specifically. I was a giant Dragonlance fan and I played through all the modules as I previously mentioned as Raceland, but obviously our plot line was not the same as the books. Right. Um, <laughs> and I was doing a little metagaming because I had read all the books. So. <laughs> but I felt that kind of matched Raceland <laughs> in a sense. That, like, somehow he got, he got a copy of uh, Dragons of Autumn Twilight. Um, uh, but it, it is very important to... Like it's a great critical role is great to look at and to understand like the mood of the setting. But the, at the end of the day, like any campaign setting, it's your game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You are not obligated to include the characters from any live stream show or any show or even in any book. You you, mm -hmm. you take what you want and you make your own story. And yeah. and, and and I, I think this is one of those books where people could be um, too focused. Like, oh, am I get, getting it right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not gonna be. I'm not gonna lie. I I, I want to run several games in this setting and i'm nervous about mm -hmm. it but i need to go over that <laughs> because because you just need to have that freedom as a dungeon master and as players to affect the world um otherwise it's not gonna be fun yeah. i mean you're just watching a movie otherwise it's it's also a chance to take your favorite things from the show that maybe are not covered as much. Maybe you have a favorite NPC like Kiri the Kenku, um, and <laughs> you want to have a whole adventure centered around where Kiri is now and what's happening. You can do that. You want to um, all play a Pumat soul, right? <laughs> like you can you can do that kind of stuff. So I would say let the you know let the show and the characters um, be your universe for whatever you want because I. I think like all things Critical Role, it really is D&D &D first. It's D&D &D facing. So unlike Star Wars or The Lord of the Rings where there's this set story and it's like, well, no matter what, Frodo's throwing that ring in the volcano, so it doesn't really matter what you do. Um, you <laughs> yeah, know. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's very hard to be in the Lord of the Rings universe and feel like you matter. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> like you, re you really uh, move things around. Mm -hmm. um, and also clearly very hard in the Star Wars universe now, um, you know. <laughs> yeah. And you better check your ancestry.com. Otherwise, you do not matter. Yeah. Um, well, and you could, I mean. <laughs> we're, we're getting controversial over here. <laughs> <laughs> because. Hey, I, I, I like the last movie, but I'm just saying. <laughs> That's true. Like, this has become. The Last Jedi talk with Todd. Todd, tell us about The Last Jedi. No, no, I'll, I'll tell you about The Last Jedi. <laughs> um, but, but one of the things that like could be really fun, again, because it is this game where like failure happens at times when dice dictate it, right? Not at times when uh, a director or a writer or an actor dictate it. Um, 
you could play the the adventurers who go and clean up all the mighty nines messes right yeah. like <laughs> yeah I they never kind of leave a place perfectly <laughs> there's always trouble when they go Call you know the cleaning crew you know? yeah <laughs> 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 you're you're just you're just fixing up everything oh god that's that is very charming i i always like those like psych like you know sometimes you get that with tv shows and other stories or like uh mm -hmm. where you see the other side of things i always find that stuff delightful we do have a question a couple of questions here um yeah. i don't know did any of you work on the mechanics because i can speak to a mm -hmm. little, little bit of this there one of them is uh who designed the mechanics behind the new subclasses and can you tell us everything you know anything about them or the new Denomancy spells. Um, yeah. Matt worked with Jeremy Crawford and the entire D&D yes. &D team. These mm -hmm. subclasses are balanced. Yeah, that's... They have been worked on. <laughs> Denomancy spells have been, you know, thoroughly vetted as yeah. Jeremy Crawford specifically said on Twitter. I saw the um, notes, three rounds of revisions uh, and then wizards got their hands on it and had the final say. So this, yeah. is, this is as vetted as a project can get. Mm -hmm. Yes, and there uh, there was extensive playtesting. There, I, I like lots of people were asked their opinions on things. Mm -hmm. um, I I am I, we can't say everything, but I will <laughs> tell you that I love Dumancy. Mm -hmm. Um I love I do like timey wimey stuff. I do like gravity bending stuff. Control currently is my favorite video game ever made in my mind mm -hmm. right now. Um, because I just I like throwing things around, and I obviously <laughs> love, love breaking the time continuum. Mm. um much to all of my players this may <laughs> like time is never not a plot line in my my games mm -hmm. um and breaking time i will often um it's a cheesy it's it's a cheesy hook but i always like to have uh like shadowy figures in the background that are actually maybe the players uh three mm. years from now after we're done <laughs> like after we're like level 18 <laughs> like you were there all the time you know that kind of stuff um yeah. so dunamancy is like it's so cool Mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. what i'm gonna say just look at my face it's really awesome the subclasses are really dope yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> i feel you will be very happy and it's funny because i see a lot of comments on youtube i've been monitoring them very closely and there are some people who are like i'm just really not into critical role but those subclasses though <laughs> <laughs> they are though the, the echo knight that lets your fighter create like a shadowy clone of themselves to fight alongside them yeah ah, it's so cool like People talk about time bending stuff with Dunamancy all the time because that's like that's what punches you in the face, like time magic. <laughs> but this like it's time and space is what Dunamancy has power. Yeah. It's like it, Matt derived the word from a Greek root for like potential. It's mm -hmm. the magic of potentiality, what could happen. And so like bending space to your will is is harder to visualize, but like bringing a bring a copy of yourself into the world to fight alongside you sapping like the potential energy yes. from an attacker <laughs> it's like whoa it's 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 weird sci almost sci-fi cool stuff yeah uh, that, yeah that's that's a, that's a very important part of uh the concept of those spells is that potentiality that potentiality mm -hmm. in D and D and in life has a magic of its own so like right before a really big fight happens or something important mm -hmm. happens that in a sense from my interpretation from my conversations with matt is kind of like getting wrapped up in the weave and that mm -hmm. that potential you know that tension before something really amazing happens like if you can think of um what's about to happen being like gravity from a planetoid it's kind of like that in my mind. That's how I think of it. And that, mm -hmm. that, that tension can be exploited and released or taken yeah. away um, is super fun. And, yeah. and, and something so new, unique for D&D. And, and you can think of this time and space as almost connected because just like a, a massive body, just like a planet has sort of a, a spatial gravity well, uh, incredible events in history have kind of like a temporal gravity well as yeah. well. Things kind of pull towards them. And the best thing uh, that I find about them too is like they are weird spells in Wild Mount too, mm. right? The, it's not like there's a uh, Dunamancer walking around on every street uh, in every city <laughs> in Wild Mount, right? It, it is. is. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost a, it's like a weapon. One side of the war has kind of started to unlock this magical potential that hasn't been realized in the world. So the fact that it is 
weird and alien to us uh, as players also works within the game that it is weird and alien to the world kind yes. of that it's in. Uh, and it has that feeling of like, we found this ancient thing and it's unlocking potential. And now I'm closing my fist and I'm crushing you like you're a grape <laughs> from 10 feet away with gravity magic. Yeah. Good stuff. Oh uh, we have another question. Are both caster subclasses wizards? Um, yes. That's my yes. understanding. They're both wizards. We're getting two wizards. And I know, I, I know we got a lot of wizards, but these two wizards are dope. Um, mm -hmm. I'm using dope a lot today. But yeah, it's gravity and time. Like, how do you not want those two things? It's peanut butter and jelly. So um, I think I think these are very cool new subclasses for wizards to get. Yeah. Um, and uh, Echo Knight, I, um, I'm jealous of personally. I've already talked to Joey about this. I think I already told Matt I was pretty jealous because I, I had made something like that once. Mm -hmm. um, it, that uh, And I'm like, yeah, you did it better, jerk. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Can I talk about this? I can't talk about this. No comment. No comment. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> yeah. Keep your ear to the ground. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, so it, I, I think you're going to be, everyone's going to, I think hardcore D&D &D fans are just going to be in love with this new type of magic and these new subclasses because I am. So, mm -hmm. uh, and I've been playing since first edition. So if you want to, if, if, if you want to talk about being there since the beginning, <laughs> I'll have that conversation for you. <laughs> I, I am I am so overwhelmingly excited for this book, and I, and it, it brings such a, a different vibe and a lot of tools. I think I've always wanted to have, and I think that's what's remarkable about it. Uh, mm -hmm. What what is what are your favorite elements to the book, other than your own writing, or it can be your own writing? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I am going to uh, name a piece of writing that was done by my friend James uh, over here, uh, which is uh, the Heroic Chronicle, um, which I know Matt has mentioned before. Uh, it is just an amazing way to uh, create a backstory for a character, whether you're the kind of player who loves to get into the nitty gritty and write 30 pages and like it's got this you know guide for you. Uh, or if you're the kind of player who likes to grab a handful of dice and say, yeah, these are all things I rolled. How do they fit together? Which is uh, me. Yeah. Uh, you've got that going on. And it is like just a really rich way to connect yourself to the world without getting so into the weeds that it like half your stuff never comes up mm -hmm. uh, in your game with your GM. And also is a yeah. great way, I think, to entice players into interacting with the world and like, making stuff matter uh like mm -hmm. you'll roll on this table and be like oh wow now i have these people and these places and these things that all matter to me in this setting and that's cool mm -hmm. uh, and i'd argue enticing the dm mm -hmm. um oh yeah I love player backstories and yes. i want to be reminded that they have them i want to be able to bring up heroes and and uh joey and i talked about this a little bit uh it is a pet peeve of like um i know some uh uh, not knocking people who just make up characters on the fly, but it is very difficult for a DM to be like, so do you have a brother or any family members? <laughs> and then, <laughs> then you have to wait another year before you introduce them. Like, oh, it's a surprise. You know, like, you know, that, that you have some long lost sibling. Um, so mm -hmm. like having having that backstory for your character or at least not, not necessarily backstory totally, totally filled out, but at least, I, you know, a list of things gives your DM a lot of opportunity to yeah. personalize your experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why I'm excited for the system that Joey developed. So I have a young cousin who uh, I- I Is he your villain? <laughs> <laughs> Is he out to get you right now? <laughs> I, I spent a lot of time hanging out with him over the holidays and uh, he made like every single hour I was there, he just had a notepad and a pen and he came up with five different character concepts, like every hour of Christmas Day, basically. Mm -hmm. And he was like, yeah, and this next one's gonna be an elf barbarian with such and such. Wait, wait like, a minute, am I your cousin? <laughs> <laughs> and and he, he derived so much joy just from every single like character concept he bashed together. And I, I remember when I did that all the time, and Todd, you do that all the time, and I know that so many people 
love you know this sort of single player D D experience where you're creating yeah. mechanical characters like what will this character look at level 20 let me plot out what their progression will be like uh todd and i go into we'll go into more detail on this in a, another video we put out later but the heroic chronicle will in part let you do that from the storytelling aspect of your character rather than just from the mechanical aspect. It delves you deep into the lore of Wildmount. It lets you pick and choose if you want to, or it lets you just sort of roll and discover who your character is, what their role is in the world. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. It's that is that might be my favorite part of uh the book just because it's 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 my baby it's so close to me so um, james you know not 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 to make fun of you but so so james and tricasso's favorite thing about the book is what you worked on and your favorite thing is also yeah. what you worked yeah. on well <laughs> I, I have also pretty often said greedy, pretty, uh, pretty self-absorbed joey <laughs> I, Though, I have often said that james is the better writer of the two of us and to give you so to give you an idea he hired me for my first job. Um, so I learned from him, even though he is 10 years uh, younger than me and going to live a much longer and more fruitful life. Uh, so there you go. Um, Whereas I, though, have trouble, I have trouble getting a tweet out. <laughs> <laughs> though I will say, and I'm not just covering my butt here, is that another one of my favorite parts of this book is the Isilcross stuff that that james wrote because yes i've been uh, told some about this yeah <laughs> um, like, like, like joey very specifically said so if you do run yeah. <laughs> it's right this up is very Alley. much your kind of wheelhouse <laughs> <laughs> um and and i i love it for a couple of reasons the big picture reason is the stuff that we haven't seen in critical role the mysterious stuff that has always been you know not had the camera focused on it that uh that plucks up my brain it makes me want to see it and so we're already going into eyes across with that mysterious attitude and like beyond that it is this land of you know it's it's locked in ice both the Kreen Dynasty and the Nundalian Empire want to get at whatever powerful thing is inside it because there's this crashed flying city from an ancient age that is splayed across the ice, locked inside, and everyone knows it's full of cool stuff. It's full mm -hmm. of magic and artifacts and even technology from a bygone <laughs> era. Um, and so, you know, there's like espionage between the two warring nations. There's like Cold War stuff going on there, even when an actual hot war is going on elsewhere. And there's, uh, I can't bring myself to say anymore. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I gotta yeah, save yeah, it for the we're, book. We're in danger. We, yeah. Yeah, I feel, we I feel sat like down. Is watching right now. Or... <laughs> when we oh, sat down to talk about the book for the first time, Matt was like, oh, you know, there's this thing, uh, Isilcross, and he's sort of like, almost threw away this detail that I think everybody was like, hang on, wait, go back. What was that? <laughs> what is happening there? Um, and we'll just say it's a thing that uh, Todd has mentioned he really loves in this chat at some point. It, it mm -hmm. has to do with mm -hmm. something Todd has mentioned he loves. Um, so, uh, uh, and it rhymes like with... It rhymes with whimey. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's all I'll say. <laughs> Deeply mysterious. How will we unravel this plot? <laughs> Rhymey? Yeah, it's, it's, it's limey. Todd loves limes. I, I do. Fight and scurvy. Big I fan. Actually, I, oh, that hurts. That's a deep cut. I'm one of the few people do, who have ever had scurvy in America. Really? No. <laughs> oh, no. I yeah, did not who, know. Who aren't a pirate? <laughs> <laughs> don't eat only saltines for your kids um, <laughs> or be terribly poor uh so yeah eat your vegetables <laughs> uh, no i am sorry you. i didn't know you have had no no no, that's, no no <laughs> you're canceled <laughs> well, no, we had a good run. <laughs> yeah, he had a he had a, he had a good run in that D and D world, or that tabletop <laughs> RPG world. But I'm gonna shut you down now. Um, I have that power. Uh, we have another question from Twitch chat. Could you alter the heroic chronicle to fit another world or setting? I yes, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Um, if I were in charge, every single published campaign setting ever published would have a hero chronicle in some way shape or form mm -hmm. there there's definitely there's definitely a lot of stuff that is 
specific to wild mount mm -hmm. um but there's I, I'd, I'd say it's like 60 40 maybe 70 30. um there yeah it's like it's like 60 30 and then there's like sort of nebulous 10 percent which is wild mount like tuned to wild mount but that any campaign setting could use also right like there's a good there there's a good uh framework that mm -hmm. you can okay my camera is yeah. just giving up on life um <laughs> right because because the goal of it is to give you an easy way to uh base your character in wild mount without having to read through the entire 300 page encyclopedia that this book is uh but also it has stuff regarding your family, your family history, the allies and enemies that have come out of your past relationships, the events that started you adventuring. So uh, yes, it can be adapted. It's not the easiest thing in the world to adapt, but it's not the hardest thing in the world either. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, how are the vestiges going to affect other books in the future? We can't. <laughs> uh, we, are, we are getting okay we are getting a lot of questions we just can't yeah there's a, there's a lot yeah. Of yeah. Right there. uh yeah but they're very cool uh i will say they're cool uh, yeah the the book is uh out of print now but if you have the Taldore campaign setting published by green ronin publishing uh the vestiges there uh, there are a bunch of new vestiges, vestiges you haven't mm -hmm. seen in this book. But if you want an idea, a feel for how they will work, uh, that's a good place to start. Yeah. 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 And if, you know, I don't think it's giving too much away because they're in that book to say that they're magic items that kind of level up with you mm -hmm. uh, is, is one way to describe them. So they're like, uh, instead of trading your plus one sword for a plus two sword, uh, which is not a thing that happens in fifth edition that much anyway, but uh, you will be able to uh, to sort of level up with your items yeah. and your items have like this cool overarching story. Mm -hmm. And like all good things, uh, there are some evil ones. So yeah. Yeah. I, I want to get into the weeds here for just two minutes. Winner Vista is going to be a player, uh, playable race, though. That's why. Oh, <laughs> the sentient magic item creation rules. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, I did have that. I made that as a background. It's available as pay what you want on the DMs Guild. Uh, it's the polymorphed I, I, background. <laughs> I, I'm, um, I'm literally playing my, my my main character now is literally a pile of magical items. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this is like crap that got left on the dungeon the dungeon floor and just some, like the radiation just became sentient um and that that's my boy he's just a pile of junk so my last uh, word on the on the vestiges okay. before we go on is that uh back in third edition dungeons and dragons there's a book called weapons of legacy and that's kind of the the core of this idea is that every time you leveled up while you had this weapon the weapon got incrementally stronger with you um mm -hmm. and so it was a very sort of like mechanically focused uh, way of leveling up your weapon uh, in, in true third edition style. Uh, Critical Role as a, as a show and as sort of a design philosophy is much more story focused than that. So instead of having, uh, you know, five to 20, 15 individual moderately different tiers of power for your growing weapon, each, uh, each vestige has three distinct states Mm -hmm. that unlock new in-game mechanical powers but the transition from one state to another isn't oh my character gained a level so my right. weapon will gain a level also um th it's an important character moment that's like crucial to both me and to the story of the weapon happened so now its power begins to bloom and and the the great and also challenging thing about that is that it's very personalized you as the dm have to know what your players are all about or what, what their characters are all about and tie in that story together that's what matt mercer does on critical role and so it's it's a little bit more work for you to find a great point for your you know for your vestige to reach exalted status but it's it's a bigger moment it's a more fulfilling moment than just oh i reached level 15 here's my new greater power for my legacy weapon and yeah I, because man I love just having the same sword, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Arthur didn't trade out Excalibur at thirteenth level. <laughs> <laughs> no, he lost the scabbard. That's what happened. That's oh man, you just beat me by a second. I'm like, you, you almost got me my my Excalibur hobby horse. It wasn't the sword that was important. It was the scabbard that kept him mm -hmm. immortal. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Sorry. No. He should have <laughs> shape have about this. Stone that thing to him to his skin. Uh but Read then he could medieval stories, kids. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what I what I love about what you're saying, Joey, is not just the awesome story that's there, is that then when you add in evil vestiges, you might be like, wow, the next thing that my ex can do is really cool but I need to do something super evil to make it get there. Yeah. And so you've got, again, mm -hmm. that idea of like, are you willing to sell a little piece of your soul figuratively to get more power? I don't know, with an evil vestige, it might be literally too. Now that right. we're talking yeah. about, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh man, I don't I'm mean to second guess you every time you bring this analogy <laughs> up. <geez. laughs> I don't mean to, to quote the Morbius trailer, but I mean I do like this one turn of phrase. Like, at what point is the cure worse than like what it takes to cure something worse than mm. the thing itself? And, and that, that's like the, an, an interesting point to make is like, you know, how much evil is worth good? Yeah, and that's, well, and that's it, always a fun thing to play with. Yeah, if you're a, if you're a DM like Todd, you might say like the only way to defeat X evil is to take Y evil magic item and you know get it all the way up to exalted. So good luck, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yes, I like to railroad people very much. <laughs> uh, yeah, you better get that to that volcano, kids. Um, <laughs> That's the only time splitting the party worked out, I guess. But mm -hmm. yeah, that's PTSD. <laughs> I don't recommend it. Uh, how, how long did the process start to finish? I don't think we'll comment on how long it took necessarily. This I think Mac made a post about it on Reddit. It's like oh, he did. Okay, half. then. Yeah. 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 Like okay. Well, then go ahead. Knock it out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't think there's too much to say. Uh, okay. it, it it trades between a lot of people. We had it for a bit. Matt had it for a bit. Wizards had it for a bit. We all had it for a bit. Uh, it's about a year and a half from from start to finish. Yeah, I am. Uh, yeah, from what I have seen, I I am tremendously excited and and can't really wait for March. So <laughs> that, 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 that's what I'll say about that. Um, any were there any specific ways that Matt challenged you? I know we only have five minutes left. It's a it's a question in chat. Um, yeah. Uh, I so I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, by, by nature of having it be an open forum, um, it was like, uh, you know, we had weekly meetings um, where we would talk about stuff. And it was like, you were sort of challenged every week to show up and talk about like, these are my ideas. And these are the things that I would like to do. And sometimes those were specific, you know, we would leave a meeting with like, hey, next week, everybody come with three adventure ideas and, you know, be ready. Um, and then uh, other weeks, it would just be like, hey, tell me what you're working on, <laughs> you know? Uh, and so it was, but there was this, by having things be so open uh, and by the fact that you're working with uh, some of the greatest uh, creatives in the biz, um, it was really like very much like, okay, I, I know personally it was challenging in that way of like, come with ideas and like, I want to hear your ideas. So you better not be afraid to share them and you better be proud of them. If you're going to, you know, lay them at the feet of Matt Mercer and James Hake and Chris Lockie. So. Yeah. Ditto everything James just said. Um, coming up with new stuff that doesn't fit the standard mold that a D and D book has done before is always challenging. Um, mm -hmm. Writing a, I don't know how, how I want to say this, uh, but you know, it's it's not easy to write subclasses and spells and stuff. But you know what you're doing when you're doing that. There's a lot of stuff in this book where we felt like we were out at sea, like you know, we were forging a new trail through the forest. It was all uh, all uncharted territory, and so that was a, that was the biggest challenge for me. Yeah. Can we that's squeeze all, one last all, question in there? That seems horrifyingly scary to me. <laughs> <laughs> Joey knows I find this all to be very intimidating. Um, and, and, and good on you guys for surviving. <laughs> but no, it's good. It's good. They gave you so much um, lead way to, to create something new because mm -hmm. if, if, if a setting is too stifling um, or you're making a prequel, for example, <laughs> like, well, we know how it ends. Um, mm. There's not yeah. much you can really do. Uh, yeah. There like were some stuff. things that it was like, 
you know, they were, they seemed kind of crazy and Matt let us run with them. And I don't know about you, Joey, but I was like, surely when this gets to, you know, X person in the process, it'll be cut or whatever. And you would see notes back that were like, wow, this is really cool. We've never done anything like this. Let's mm -hmm. go ahead. And it was just like, wow. So like, not just Matt, but kudos go on up to Wizards and everybody else too for uh, letting us embrace some risky things uh, yes. that I think, you know, they obviously honed and helped us make even better. Yeah. I, I yeah, I want to give a big thank you to Wizards for letting us, you know, do all of this stuff too. Uh, yeah, simple as that. Uh, final, f final thoughts. Um, were you, were you, what are you more most excited for, either in the book or about what's happening right now? Yeah, oh no. my gosh! Oh. <laughs> uh, I'm the 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 hype has fried my brain after yesterday, after <laughs> the announcement yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, just having people get this book in their hands and see it all, um, mm -hmm. because there's just so much crammed into this. It's a 300 plus page book. It's got four adventures. It's got like 50 new spells or something it's got three new subclasses it's got a, a full gazetteer of the entire world it's got factions and characters and like i i don't know how all of this stuff got fit in and the ton of stuff was cut too how did we make all this i don't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah i am most excited for uh similar to the Taldere guide there are adventure hooks throughout the entire gazetteer section um and they go from personal to enormous to uh small and scary to enormous and epic and fun um and uh i am excited to see how people take those and run with it mm -hmm. uh and i am also excited to see like i think what we are going to see is a bunch of shows that are not critical role uh, that take place in wild Matt. and i'm excited mm -hmm. to see those stories and those podcasts and people get super creative uh cleanup crew of the mighty nine i want to see that show <laughs> and, and, and matt has said he very much wants to see that happen mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he very much wants to see this, this spread and people make it feel okay with making it their own um and also for the community to be okay with seeing different takes on this world as well yeah yeah um uh, yeah, I'm excited. Think of it like this, like, yeah. like Star Wars and Mandalorian. Like, there's like all kinds of neat, like you know, it's the when fandoms diverge and create different stories, it's always more fun. Yeah, it's oh, always so much more fun. Critical yeah. Role uh, is, you know, it's it is a visual story, right? It's a stream, but it's it's not a cartoon yet. It's not live action or anything like that. <laughs> it's and so like the fan art of critical role has a ton of wildly varying takes on what the characters look like yeah you know, there's there's official art so a lot of people do cleave to the official stuff but the people who go out there and and make cool interesting character redesigns um you know while being respectful of stuff like you know keeping the dark skin characters skin tone you know Appropriate. accurate yeah, appropriate yeah. right you know but people who will develop wild new costumes for the characters or you know change the way the tieflings horns look that's that fires me up about the cr art community and so i want to see that same level of of creativity and willingness to defy canon and what is written yes. to like into new streams from it that mm -hmm. Mm, I want that so much. I know. Yeah. Ack Inc. in Wild Mount. Like, you know, like there's so many things that have the tools to do it now. So yes. they're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to go right to your guy, story. They're going to go right to your adventure first. You know that, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> the only section of that that are, they're just going to be like, well, that's where all the weird things are. Yes. <laughs> uh, James, James Intercasso, James Hake, thank you so much for being on the show. Um, I am tremendously excited for the book I, I you have to feel pride at how well it well it's currently doing as far as pre-orders and everything else you've done an immense job i'm very excited to run these adventures and play them so thank you so much for being on the show great talking I mean, with you james thank had you joey had to be on the show <laughs> <laughs> he's my lead writer so <laughs> well, thank you so much everyone yeah have thanks for day. having me on james talks i appreciate it it's been <laughs> you're welcome well, you're welcome everyone. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>